Good evening. It's Wednesday, January 19th. The United States Senate poised to vote yet tonight on voting rights legislation. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer promised a vote and that senators would have to go on the record voting to support or oppose expanding voter protections. To the beating heart of our democracy is voting rights. President Biden holds his first White House press conference in nearly two months today on the eve of his first year in office. And he turns it into a marathon affair lasting nearly two hours. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Ukraine today for talks with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. He plans it's to not assure to Zelensky of U.S. support amid fears of a potentially imminent Russian invasion. If it's not going to produce uh, results, it's going to be because Russia has chosen another path, not because the United States and our European allies, Ukraine, have not sought to resolve the differences that we have with Russia uh, on a peaceful basis through dialogue and through diplomacy. A top Russian diplomat, though, says Moscow will accept nothing less but watertight U.S. guarantees precluding NATO's expansion to Ukraine, even though those demands were rejected last week by the United States and its allies. The New York Attorney General says her investigation into former President Trump's business holdings has uncovered evidence that Trump's company is fraudulent or misleading asset valuations to get loans and to get tax benefits. The Biden administration will begin making 400 million N95 masks available for free to Americans starting next week. And California Attorney General Rob Bonta launches an investigation into the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Merkel. The United States Senate is still debating tonight the fate of Democrat-backed voting rights legislation ahead of an expected evening vote. Republicans are in lockstep opposition, making conservative Democrats like West Virginia's Joe Manchin key votes in an effort to change a Senate rule in order to allow a actual majority vote on the actual legislation. Christopher Martinez files this report. The Senate Wednesday carried out a lengthy and passionate debate over voting rights legislation that is headed to a near certain defeat by filibuster. Democratic Senate leader Chuck Schumer argued for the bill on the Senate floor. In our nation's history, moments of significant progress have often been followed by reactionary backlash. Unfortunately, it seems, led by one party, compelled by the most dishonest president in our history, we are in another of those dark periods. That is why for the first time, the first time in this Congress, the Senate is debating and will vote on legislation to confront these threats. The Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. The measure is supported by all 50 Democratic senators, but it's opposed by all 50 Republicans. That leaves only one path forward, changing the Senate's filibuster rule to allow a majority vote rather than requiring 60 votes. That means the real question is whether moderate Democrats would join in changing the rule. That makes West Virginia Democrat Joe Manchin a key vote, even though he's opposed changing the rule. But Manchin is more concerned with growing political divisiveness. I heard when the good old days, okay, I don't know what happened to the good old days, but I can tell you they're not here now. He says he's opposed to changing a rule that he says leads to consensus. The filibuster plays an important role in stabilizing our democracy from the transitory passions of the majority and respecting the input, input of the minority in the Senate. Contrary to what some have said, protecting the role of the minority, Democrat or Republican, has protected us from the volatile political swings that we have endured over the last 233 years. 
Republican senators are united against changing the filibuster. Tom Tillis is a Republican from North Carolina. Awareness is need to head. After the tensions cool, and after what I hope is a failed vote today to change the rules. And incidentally, the day that Republicans change the rules for the filibuster is the day I resign from the Senate. And I believe that I have a number of members on my side of the aisle that would never do it. Democrats say their measure is a response to Republican state legislation that restricts voting. The only African-American Republican senator, Tim Scott of South Carolina, defended state voting restriction measures and took issue with President Joe Biden for calling them Jim Crow 2.0. To have a conversation in a narrative that is blatantly false is offensive, not just to me or Southern Americans, but offensive to millions of Americans who fought, bled, and died for the right to vote. So if we're going to have an honest conversation about the right to vote, let's engage in that based on the facts of the laws that are being passed not the rhetoric surrounding those laws. That brought a response from Democrat Cory Booker of New Jersey, who was also African-American. Don't lecture me about Jim Crow. I know this is not 1965. That's what makes me so outraged. It's 2022. And they're blatantly removing more polling places from the counties where black and Latinos are overrepresented. I'm not making that up. That is a fact. The debate continued as senators headed to an expected evening vote. As for the debate before that vote, three, two, one. The debate continued as senators headed toward an expected evening vote. As for the debate before that vote, perhaps Manchin got that one right. And uh, we've all learned a lot. And uh, I'm not sure it's changed anything, but we sure have learned a lot in this process. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. The Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act would create national automatic voter registration, allow all voters to cast ballots by mail, and weaken voter ID laws in the states. It would also ban partisan gerrymandering and force dark money groups to disclose their major donors. It's an effort by Democrats to pass a major overhaul before the November elections, and it's a response to what voting rights advocates say is an effort by Republican-led states to make it harder for African Americans and others to vote. One of the states that has adopted laws restricting voter access is Montana where groups representing young people are trying to stop the new election laws from going into effect before that state's primary in June. Eric Tegetoff reports. The Forward Montana Foundation, Montana Public Interest Research Group, and Montana Youth Action are challenging three laws passed by the legislature in 2021, including an end to election day registration and stricter voter ID laws that require another form of identification with a student ID. Riley Summers Flanagan, who heads Upper Seven Law, is representing the group. When you have a bunch of laws that restrict voting or that even nominally make voting more difficult, those laws will interact with one another to land most heavily on youth populations. So you're just going to see a natural reduction in youth turnout because you've made it more complicated for them. The groups also are challenging a law that prohibits ballots from being sent out to voters before their 18th birthday, even those who will be 18 by Election Day. Montana lawmakers and Secretary of State Christy Jacobson say these laws are necessary to ensure the integrity of the state's elections, a top concern for Republicans. The youth civics groups have filed a motion for a preliminary injunction to stop these laws from being enforced before the Montana primary on June 7th. Summers Flanagan calls it unfortunate that the Montana legislature has set up these impediments to voting for young people. They're disappointing in the sense that I wish that we didn't have to bring them, but they're exciting in the sense that especially the youth voting case is one that talks about young people caring a lot about being involved in politics and being involved in elections and having a role in the way that democracy unfolds. A hearing is scheduled for March 10th. The court will also hear other challenges to election laws, including a suit from Native American groups on the law ending election day voter registration. I'm Eric Tegadoff reporting. 
President Joe Biden held his first White House press conference in nearly two months today on the eve of his first year in office, and it turned into a marathon affair lasting nearly two hours. At the outset, Biden acknowledged that many Americans feel frustrated and fatigued, and he cited the ongoing coronavirus pandemic and the sudden appearance of an inflation rate that has not been seen in America for decades, and which has emerged as an economic threat to the nation and a political risk for Biden. Biden said he's launched a three-prong attack on the problem. One, efforts to fix the supply chain disrupted by the coronavirus pandemic, which has led to shortages of some consumer products on the shelves, as well as key manufacturing components like computer chips used to make automobiles. Secondly, attempts to promote competition in an increasingly monopolized marketplace. Biden cited skyrocketing meat prices, which he blamed on concentration in the meatpacking industry, where four meat processing companies dominate the market. And three, economic programs and reforms contained in his massive Build Back Better legislation, currently stalled in the U.S. Senate. The Build Back Better plan will address the biggest cost of working families face every day. No other plan will do more to lower the cost for American families. It cuts the cost of, for child care. Many families, including the people sitting in this room, if they have children and they're working full time, many families pay up to $14,000 a year for child care in big cities, less than that in smaller ones. My plan cuts that in half. That will not only be a game changer for so many families' budgets, but it will mean so much for the nearly 2 million women, who, women who've left the workforce during the pandemic because of things like child care. My Build Back Better plan cuts the price of prescription drugs, so insulin, that today costs some people as much as $1,000 a month, will cost no more than $35 a month. It cuts the cost of elder care, it lowers energy costs, and it will do all this without raising a single penny in taxes on people making under $400,000 a year or raising the deficit. In fact, my plan cuts the deficit and boost the economy by, by, by getting more people into the workforce. That's why 17 Nobel Prize winners for economics say it will ease long-term inflationary pressure. The bottom line, if price increases are what you're worried about, the best answer is my Build Back Better plan. Biden said he would likely break up the Build Back Better legislation and settle for big chunks of the economic package in order to get it through the Congress. The president also acknowledged that he underestimated how strong the Republican resistance against him would be, as his bipartisan infrastructure deal, which passed, appears to be the only main exception to fierce and unyielding partisan divisiveness that now defines U.S. politics. Biden said he did not anticipate that there would be such a stalwart effort by Republicans to make sure that the most important thing was that President Biden didn't get anything done. I did not anticipate that there'd be such a stalwart effort to make sure that the most important thing was that President Biden didn't get anything done. Think about this. What are Republicans for? What are they for? Name me one thing they're for. And so the problem here is that I think what's happens, what I have to do and the, and the change in, in the tactic, if you will, I have to make clear to the American people what we are for. We've passed a lot. We've passed a lot of things that people don't even understand what's all that's in it, understandably. Biden fielded questions about Russia's intentions with Ukraine, nuclear talks with Iran, voting rights, political division, Vice President Kamala Harris's place on the 2024 ticket trade with China, and the competency of government. For the first half of the news conference, Biden stuck to an organized plan calling on reporters from a list in a binder. 
Then he went rogue. It started when CNN's Jeff Zelaney broke in with a question that referenced concerns many Americans hold about the competence of government after the chaotic Afghanistan withdrawal and the recent shortage of testing for COVID-19. His questions opened the floodgates. Biden took took to calling on reporters at random. And what started as a very traditional presidential news conference became something else entirely, stretching to nearly two hours. Biden took some unusual and unusual blunt questions when the session was opened up to all the journalists in front of him, jousting with Fox News Channel's Peter Ducey, whose network has been relentlessly criticism of Biden. Biden said to him, you always ask me the nicest questions. Ducey said he had a whole binder full. And then Ducey asked, why are you trying so hard in your first year to pull the country so far to the left? Well, I'm not, Biden replied, saying, you guys have been trying to convince me that I'm Bernie Sanders. Biden said, I'm not. I like him. I'm not Bernie Sanders. I'm not a socialist. I'm a mainstream Democrat. Biden called on James Rosen of the conservative Newsmax network, who asked the president about a poll that found a significant percentage of respondents questioning whether or not Biden was mentally fit. I'll let you all make the judgment whether they're correct or not, Biden replied sharply. Next, but Rosen pressed on, wondering why he thought many Americans have profound concerns about your cognitive fitness. I have no idea, Biden said, and then did move on. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. The New York Attorney General says her investigators have uncovered evidence that former President Donald Trump's company used fraudulent or misleading valuations of its golf clubs, skyscrapers, and other property to get loans and tax benefits. In a court filing late yesterday, lawyers for Attorney General Letitia James told a judge they have not decided whether or not to bring a lawsuit in connection with the allegations, but that investigators should be allowed to question Trump and his two eldest children under oath as part of the civil probe. William Denisler reports. In a court filing, New York Attorney General Letitia James accused the Trump business of misstating the value of six properties to the IRS, insurers and lenders. In a statement, the Democrats said the former president and the Trump business did so fraudulently for economic benefit. A spokesperson for the Trump organization calls the claims politically motivated and baseless. Last month, Donald Trump filed a lawsuit against James in a bid to block her civil investigation. She's issued a subpoena to question Trump and his children, Donald Trump Jr. and Ivanka. In 2020, she questioned Trump's son, Eric. Court filings show he invoked his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination for more than 500 questions. James's civil investigation is running parallel to a criminal probe into Trump's business practices. William Denzelo, New York. The Trump Organization issued a statement calling the investigation baseless and politically motivated. The court documents filed last night contain the Attorney General's most detailed accounting yet of a long-running investigation into allegations that Trump's company exaggerated the value of its holdings to impress lenders or misstated what land was worth to slash its tax burden. The Trump Organization, James's office said, overstated the value of land donations made in New York and California on paperwork submitted to the Internal Revenue Service to justify several millions of dollars in tax deductions. At his marathon press conference today, President Joe Biden said he believes Vladimir Putin does not want full-blown war in Ukraine and would pay a dear price if he moves forward with a military incursion. Biden also said he believes that Russia is, is preparing to take action on Ukraine, although he doesn't think the Russian president has yet made a final decision on what to do. I think he still does not want any full-blown war. Number one. Number two, do I think he'll test the West, test the United States and NATO as, as uh, significantly as he can? Yes, I think he will. 
but I think he'll pay a serious and dear price for it that he doesn't think now will cost him what it's going to cost him. Biden suggested that he would limit Russia's access to the international banking system if it did further invade Ukraine. He's never seen sanctions like the ones I promised will be imposed if he moves, number one. Number two, we're in a situation where uh, Vladimir Putin uh, is about to, uh, we've had very frank discussions, uh, Vladimir Putin and I, and uh, the idea that NATO is not going to be united, I don't buy. I've spoken to every major NATO leader. We've had the NATO-Russian summit. We've had other, the OSCE has met, et cetera. And so I think what you're going to see is that Russia will be held accountable if it invades. And it depends on what it does. It's one thing if it's a minor incursion and then we end up having to fight about what to do and not do, et cetera. But if they actually do what they're capable of doing with the force of mass on the border, it is going to be a disaster for Russia if they further invade Ukraine and that our allies and partners are ready to impose severe cost and significant harm on Russia and the Russian economy. As to that minor incursion, Biden later in the news conference sought to clarify that he was referring to a non-military action such as a cyber attack that would be met with a similar reciprocal response. Biden's comments came hours after U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was paying a visit to Kiev and accused Russia of planning to reinforce the more than 100,000 troops that's already deployed along the Ukrainian border and suggested that number could double on relatively short order. Blinken did not elaborate, but Russia has sent an unspecified number of troops from the country's far east to its ally Belarus, which also shares a border with Ukraine, for major war games next month. Blinken's visit to the Ukrainian capital came two days before he's to meet in Geneva with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. That follows a series of inconclusive talks last week that failed to ease rising tensions. Russia maintained a tough posture today amid the tensions over the troop buildup, with a top diplomat warning that Moscow will accept nothing less but watertight U.S. guarantees precluding NATO's expansion to Ukraine. Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Rybakov, who led the Russian delegation at the security talks in Geneva last week, reaffirmed that Moscow has no intentions of invading Ukraine, as the West fears, but said that receiving Western security guarantees is an imperative for Moscow. Russian military activity has been increasing in recent weeks, but the United States has not concluded whether Putin plans to invade or whether the show of force is intended to squeeze the security concessions out of the West without an actual conflict. In Kiev today, Secretary of State Blinken reiterated U.S. demands for Russia to de-escalate tensions with Ukraine by removing its forces from the border area, something that Moscow has flatly refused to do. It is to reaffirm the United States' unwavering support for Ukraine at a time when its security, its prosperity, its democracy, its fundamental right to exist as a sovereign independent nation are facing uh, an unprecedented challenge from Russia. Blinken spoke during a press conference with Ukraine's foreign minister. It comes at a critical time. Russia's amassed 100,000 troops near the Ukrainian border. Blinken said the recent buildup, part of a long-term struggle for Ukrainian independence in the face of Russian aggression. Russia has used every strategy in its playbook to try to undermine the will of the Ukrainian people. Since 2014, Moscow manufactured a crisis and invaded Ukraine's territory in Crimea, which it occupies to this day. Moscow orchestrated a war in eastern Ukraine, which it continues to fuel using proxy forces that it leads, trains, equips, and finances. Moscow has systematically uh, sought to weaken Ukraine's democratic institutions, as well as to divide Ukrainian society using everything from election interference to disinformation to cyber attacks. 
In response, the Biden administration has pledged greater sanctions against Russia. Blinken stresses diplomacy, calls it, but talks have come to a standstill as Russia wants guarantees NATO will not accept Ukraine into its ranks. A demand the Biden administration says is a non-starter. At the same time, the administration is advocating diplomacy. It's also sending military to support Ukraine, $200 million in defensive military aid already committed. Blinken says more is coming, and he warns that would only increase should Russia actually invade. We have given more security assistance to Ukraine uh, in the last year than at any point since 2014. And as I say, we're doing that on a sustained basis. The deliveries are ongoing, again, as recently as the last few weeks, and more are scheduled in the coming weeks. Should Russia uh, carry through with any aggressive intent and uh, renew its aggression and invade Ukraine, we'll provide additional material beyond that that is already uh, in the pipeline. Meanwhile, Republican senators are pushing for greater U.S. military action after returning from a bipartisan trip to Ukraine. Republicans made those demands known. Senator James Risch of Idaho. It is disheartening to see that uh, the trajectory is in the wrong direction. It's really important that the, tra the trajectory be reversed. And the only way that's going to happen is if we start to, uh, acting now. Blinken meets with Russian officials on Ukraine on Friday. President Joe Biden declared today that he has outperformed expectations in dealing with the biggest challenge of his administration, the stubborn coronavirus pandemic. The president began his news conference today by reeling off early progress in fighting the virus, citing the number of Americans vaccinated, the massive COVID relief legislation passed by the Congress, and the 95 percent of public schools in the country open despite the pandemic. For the first time today, people across the U.S. can log on to a government website and order free at-home COVID-19 tests. The website, covidtest.gov, allows people to order four at-home tests per household and have them delivered by mail. However, the tests won't arrive for 7 to 12 days after the Omicron variant is expected to peak in many parts of the country. Experts say, nonetheless, Washington will have to do a lot more to fix the country's long troubled testing system. Should we have done more testing earlier? Yes. But we're doing more now. We've gone from zero at home tests a year ago to 375 million tests on the market in just this month. If you buy a test at a store, your insurance will reimburse you. On top of that, we're making one billion, one billion at-home tests available for you to order and be delivered to your home for free. Just visit covidtest.gov to know how to get that free test kit to your home. In addition, there are 20,000 sites where you can get tested in person for free now. The Biden administration also will begin making 400 million N95 masks available for free to U.S. residents starting next week. The step comes after federal officials emphasized the masks' better protection against the Omicron variant of COVID-19 over cloth face coverings. The White House said today the masks will come from the government's strategic national stockpile, which has more than 750 million of the highly protective masks on hand. The masks will be available for pickup at pharmacies and community health centers across the country. The White House says the masks will begin shipping this week for distribution starting late next week. Given the persistence of the pandemic, the periodic appearance of new variants of the coronavirus disease, and the constantly changing mandates and advice on how to combat coronavirus, Biden acknowledged today that the two-year-long ordeal has left Americans exhausted and demoralized. Some people may call what's happening now the new normal. I call it a job not yet finished. It will get better. We're moving toward a time when COVID-19 won't disrupt our daily lives. 
the enduring impact of COVID-19 has become a weight on Biden's presidency. Despite his best efforts to rally the country in common purpose to defeat the virus, as a candidate, he did promise to restore normalcy to a pandemic-riven nation. But overcrowded hospitals, shortages at grocery stores, and fierce divisions over vaccine mandates and face mask requirements abound around the land. Japan is imposing quasi-states of emergency in Tokyo and other regions in an effort to slow down rising coronavirus infection numbers driven by the Omicron variant. Phoebe Amorosa reports from Tokyo. The fresh restrictions will place 13 prefectures, including Tokyo, under a so-called quasi-state of emergency. This grants prefectural governors powers to restrict business hours for bars and restaurants and to introduce a ban on alcohol sales at dining establishments. COVID cases topped 32,000 on Tuesday, far exceeding the highest level logged last August. The Omicron variant is spreading widely throughout the country. Although the majority of cases are mild or asymptomatic, the sheer volume means the healthcare system is starting to come under pressure. The government has vowed to speed up the rollout of booster vaccines. So far, only around 1% of the population has received a third dose. Phoebe Amoroso, Tokyo. You are listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno online, kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast airing each night at 6 o'clock with a half-hour edition on the weekends. Our newscasts are archived online at kpfa.org. They're also available as a podcast by subscription. I'm Mark Miracle. California Attorney General Rob Bonta today launched an investigation into the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office. Nika Mirpur reports. In a press conference with the media, Attorney General Bonta announced that a team of special agents, attorneys, and legal support staff from his office are investigating allegations of unconstitutional conduct by the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office. Our investigation will seek to determine whether the Sheriff's Office has engaged in a pattern or practice of unconstitutional or unlawful conduct. Investigation, this investigation comes amidst deeply concerning allegations relating to conditions of confinement in the office's jail facilities, resistance to lawful oversight and other misconduct. These concerns have been repeatedly voiced by elected leaders, media publications, community members, community organizations, and more. And as such, at this time, we have made no determinations about specific complaints. Bonta said if the investigation found evidence of unlawful behavior, that legal action would be taken to correct the behavior. When pressed about the types of possible corrective actions that could be taken, Bonta referenced the Bakersfield Sheriff's Office, where a court-enforced judgment and independent monitor worked to create systemic changes post-investigation. Bonta emphasized the importance of public trust in government agencies in order to generate safety. Santa Clara County, he claimed, has a deficit of trust. I'm committed to this work, to ensuring our civil rights are protected, to strengthening trust between law enforcement and community. It's a critical component of my broader effort to increase public safety for all Californians. Ensuring public trust and keeping our communities and officers safe is not mutually exclusive. It's interdependent. When pressed for specific information, Bonta did say that the investigation is ongoing, but mentioned that many of the allegations had been made public. There has been much written about and and discussed about um, how individuals within uh, the the jail in Santa Clara County, how they've been treated, the conditions of confinement. Um, There have been uh, deaths and injuries in custody. and uh, we want to be, uh, we're going to be looking at all those, including uh, the use of force, as well as um, treatment or, or lack, uh, the potential for lack of appropriate treatment, including for uh, mental illness. We're also looking at the response to, to oversight. Santa Clara County Sheriff Lori Smith has been in office since 1998. She's been accused by local press and community members of bribery, corruption, and mismanagement of the county jail. California's Fair Political Practices Commission is also investigating Smith's practices related to supplying concealed gun permits in a pay-to-play scheme involving campaign contributions. In December, a civil grand jury filed a declaration in Superior Court as a result of the testimony of 65 witnesses. 
Attorney General Bonta urged members of the public to send any tips they have to police-practices at doj.ca.gov in English, Spanish, or any other language. Sheriff Smith denies all allegations made against her. For KBFA Pacifica Radio, I'm Nika Mirpur. The man accused of pushing a woman to her death in a New York City subway station has been arraigned on a murder charge and ordered held without bail. Marshall Simon was charged today in the death of Michelle Alyssa Go. She was pushed in front of a train on Saturday in the Times Square station. A mental fitness exam was ordered for Simon. Prosecutor in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office said the office is seeking to determine whether the attack was motivated by racial bias. Go was Asian American. Major international airlines today canceled flights headed to the U.S. or changed the airplanes they were using. The moves today represented the latest complication in a dispute over concerns that 5G mobile phone service could interfere with aircraft technology. Carriers took widely different approaches to the brewing crisis affecting international travel, from Emirates drastically reducing its U.S.-bound flights to Air France saying it would fly as normal. It wasn't immediately clear why the airlines made those decisions or whether they took into account a pause in the rollout of the new high-speed wireless service near key American airports. But some said they received warnings from the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration or Boeing that the plane maker's 777 was particularly affected by the new 5G antennas. The state of California is launching a new program that will pay college students $10,000 to volunteer doing public service work for a year. Suzanne Potter has the story. Announced on Tuesday, some 6,500 students will be able to join the new Californians for All College Corps and will be required to put in 450 service hours working on issues like COVID-19 recovery, climate change, and education. Josh Friday, chief service officer for the state, says it's a way to help low-income students afford college, earn credits, and gain valuable work experience. Like the GI Bill, if you are willing to serve your community and give back in a meaningful way, We are going to help you pay for college. Across the state, 45 campuses will take part, including schools from the University of California and California State University systems, plus community colleges and some private institutions. On Californians for All College Corps' website, you can find a list of schools and details on how to apply. Governor Gavin Newsom says the shared experience of giving back is intended to foster a new generation of civic-minded leaders. And if this thing works, we can go back to legislature, take it to a whole nother level. We can take it to the rest of the country because nobody else is doing this. Nobody. And unlike AmeriCorps, this program will be open to the Dreamers, undocumented students who were brought to the U.S. as children. Students who receive Pell Grants also will be able to count the $10,000 grant toward their required personal contribution to their education expenses. Support for this reporting was provided by Lumina Foundation. This is Suzanne Potter reporting. The hunting of gray wolves from Yellowstone National Park has set off alarm bells for wildlife-related businesses in the region. Eric Tegatoff reports. Secretary Deb Holland to return endangered species protections to gray wolves. Kara McGarry is owner and lead guide for In Our Nature Guiding Services out of Gardner. She says some of the wolves recently killed were from a pack she's been watching on her wildlife tours. They kind of went on a wander and two of those puppies were killed just over the boundary of the park. So it's frustrating from a business perspective as well as from kind of a personal perspective. 
New laws in Montana and Idaho allow for the killing of 85% and 90%, respectively, of the state's wolf populations. 20 wolves from Yellowstone have been killed in recent months, the most since the species was reintroduced 25 years ago, according to park officials. In September, federal officials said they would review whether protections should be restored for gray wolves. Dr. Nathan Varley is a wildlife biologist and co-owner of the Gardner-based Yellowstone Wolf Tracker. He says he and other businesses have tried to convince Montana officials to reinstate hunting quotas near the park, which were limited because wolves are important for the tourism industry. This past year, they just lifted those quotas, and that's allowed for this very high, actually historic number of wolves being taken from what we consider to be park packs, the ones that we rely on. Varley says he signed on to the letter to Holland because of Montana's unresponsiveness to businesses' concerns. McGarry is a former U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service employee. She says it's not her preference to have to go to the federal government to ask for endangered species protections for gray wolves, noting it could erode the relationships built in the region. I'm disappointed that the state of Montana has made decisions that's put us in this place, but we need intervention. So that's why I signed on personally. Businesses near Yellowstone have organized the Wild Livelihoods Business Coalition to promote management practices that allow for coexistence with wildlife. I'm Eric Tegadoff reporting. The survival of California's winter run of Chinook salmon population hangs in the balance after suffering devastated losses in 2021. It's estimated that 75% of the endangered fish were killed by the operation of Shasta Dam by state and federal water regulators. Irrigation allegations to Central Valley Farms resulted in water so warm in the Sacramento River that virtually all of the eggs spawned for the next generation failed to survive. Vic Bedoyan reports from Fresno. In a recent memorandum to the federal government, state wildlife officials verified what tribal leaders, environmental advocates, and scientists have been warning about. Winter-run Chinook salmon are on the brink of extinction in the wild. It's a result of an historically low water year combined with the fateful decision by state and federal water officials to provide massive flows of water to Central Valley farms. That left so little cold water in the spawning pools that it killed off virtually all of the next generation of fish. Doug Obiji is a water policy expert with the Natural Resources Defense Council. You know, it's really disappointing and frustrating, but not at all surprising. The the memo confirms that the operations of the Shasta Dam last year killed 75% of the endangered winter and Chinook salmon just by lethal temperatures. And when you add in other sources of natural mortality and human-caused mortality, only... I think 2.6% of those eggs survived even the first few months of life, meaning that even fewer of them are going to survive as they migrate down the Sacramento River, through the Delta, and then spend several years in the ocean. Dr. Peter Moyle is a fishery biologist with the UC Davis Institute of Watershed Sciences. He says the root of the problem is the building of dams on most Sierra rivers that has kept the winter-run and spring-run Chinook salmon from spawning in the cold water of mountain streams, forcing them to depend on state water operators for their very existence. The fact is that the winter-run Chinook salmon, are, are all their natural habitat is above dams, so it has to be replaced by artificial means. And essentially the promise of Shasta Dam when it was built really was that these fish would survive. And the way they survive is by using the cold water that's stored in the pools in the in Big Chasta Reservoir. The deep water is cold, essentially. At the heart of the crisis is a set of biological opinions that govern the amount of water that is allocated from Shasta Reservoir for human uses and for environmental needs. The Trump administration rewrote those criteria in order to maximize water deliveries for Central Valley farms. Although the Biden administration doesn't defend those measures, Obichi warns that unless they are changed soon salmon will continue to suffer. You know, it is good news that the state and federal governments recognize the need to strengthen protections um, to avoid a third really bad year for winter run Chinook salmon in 2022, and in the long run, to get rid of these biological opinions and recognize the need to have stronger protections. Winter run Chinook salmon are not alone in their struggle for survival. So is the Delta smelt. They've been in decline for years. 
mainly because of the timing and amount of water exports to farms and cities in central and southern California. The latest survey by scientists found no Delta smelt. So now, Delta smelt raised in hatcheries may have to suffice. But according to Dr. Moyle, it's not clear if that will work. I think you could say the, the Delta smelt is either extinct in the wild or so close to it, it's, uh, you know, less than a year, it's less than a year away. Uh, the, uh, and then the solution to that problem, of course, is to raise these, use these hatchery smelt and plant them in the wild to try to restore the population. That's a that's a very positive thing to try to do, but it's very difficult because the conditions that have been ma- so make it so difficult for wild smell to survive are still out there. To turn the extinction situation around, Dr. Moyle emphasizes that state and federal regulators must change their water allocation priorities. If, if we we want to have sort of salmon around in the future in California, especially there's these very special runs of salmon that we have in the state. It's going to take, eventually it'll take more water or, or better management of the, of the water that we have to uh, provide the water for the fish. In other words, we have to share California's water with the fish a lot better, better than we're doing. Because um, those fish were here here first and they're going headed for extinction because of our, the what things we've done to the streams and to our water supply. According to the Natural Resources Defense Council's Doug Obiji, time is of the essence if California's endangered salmon, as well as other aquatic species, are to survive in the wild. Our native fish and wildlife, including endangered salmon, just don't have a lot of time to waste. Um, they, they need immediate, they need protections now. Otherwise, we will start seeing species go extinct. And so, you know, that's why we're in court uh, as part of a coalition with conservation and fishing groups asking the federal court to impose stronger protections this year than what the state and feds have proposed so that we really are making sure that water deliveries are first and foremost for human health and safety and then we have adequate protections for the environment. The greatly reduced 2021 class of winter run Chinook could still survive in sufficient numbers and return to the Sacramento River. But Dr. Peter Moyle says that will depend on living conditions in the Pacific Ocean. If they make it, they'll have to contend once again with the decisions made by the human beings that now govern their fate. Vic Bedoyan reporting for KPFA News and KFCF Radio. And you are listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, KPFK in Los Angeles, online at kpfa.org. This is Kat Brooks. I'm an actor, activist, and freedom fighter. And I'm Brian Edwards Teekert. I mostly do journalism, which kind of sounds boring now. And together, we host Upfront, KPFA's local two-hour morning magazine. We bring you breaking news, debates, deep dives. Reporting on City Hall and the State House. Housing and transportation. Prisons and police. And everything big that happened while you were sleeping. And it means the two of us get to hang out with you at 7 a.m. Right after Democracy Now! on Upfront. The Biden administration has announced the release of $14 billion to the Army Corps of Engineers to fund 500 projects aimed at easing the supply chain problem. Spending stems largely from President Biden's $1 trillion (laughs) infrastructure deal. (coughs) Excuse me, the projects include upgrades to improve shipping on the Ohio River, the port of Long Beach in California, and Norfolk Harbor in Virginia. U.S. ports have struggled to manage the inflow of container ships and move containers onto trucks as the economy recovered for the pandemic, prompting delays in sending goods to consumers and higher prices. The Biden administration says it will significantly expand efforts to stave off catastrophic wildfires that have been torching areas of the West by more aggressively thinning forests around hot spots where nature and neighborhoods collide. Officials have crafted a $50 billion plan to more than double the use of controlled fires and logging to reduce vegetation that feeds fires. <coughs> Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack tells the Associated Press the work will focus on regions where out-of-control blazes wiped out neighborhoods, including California's Sierra Nevada Mountains and Colorado's Rocky Mountains. 
climate change is heating and drying out the West. That makes wildfires more intense, even as people increasingly move into fire-prone areas. Like President Biden, some two million Americans stammer or suffer from other speech impediments. A new study now shows that the afflictions may have a lot more to do with genetics than previously thought. Lily Bulky reports. There is no known cure for it, but experts say newly identified genes associated with stuttering can help them find out if there are links to other conditions or possible treatments. Shelley Jo Kraft, who directs the Behavior Speech and Genetics Lab at Wayne State University, says the new genes are helping researchers learn more about the factors that contribute to stuttering or protect people from risk. We've known stuttering is inherited for a long time, but there's been a lot of community misinformation about stuttering, a lot of stigma, a lot of misconception about why someone stutters. She says having more information about how the genes operate that lead people to stutter can help push back against those misconceptions to show that stuttering isn't a personality trait or caused by a traumatic event. Kraft notes, in addition to learning more about the genetics of stuttering, the research is showing the condition is much more prevalent than one's thought. At least 5 to 6 percent of children and 1 percent of adults experience stuttering, but she says that may be an undercount. And a lot of children do stutter for a transient amount of time during childhood and with the help of therapy, with the help of their parents and natural things that parents do in response to stuttering, the stuttering goes away. Kraft, who has collected DNA samples from roughly 1,800 people who stutter from 250 families globally, has partnered with a research lab at Vanderbilt University to expand their reach to a worldwide repository of DNA information. I'm Lee Wolke reporting. Marking President Biden's one year in office, a coalition of 900 religious leaders and dozens of immigrant rights groups sent a letter to the White House denouncing the president's continuation of several Trump immigration policies, including the expansion of immigration detention. It comes as a Harvard Law School sues federal immigration officials for failing to release records about the use of solitary confinement in immigration detention facilities. The Harvard Immigration and Refugee Clinical Program in Boston filed the suit in federal court, arguing federal agencies haven't complied with their requests in more than four years. The clinic said immigrant rights advocates have raised concerns over the use of solitary confinement on vulnerable immigrant populations, including LGBTQ individuals and people with disabilities. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security and U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement hasn't replied yet to the letter. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson was back in Parliament today to defend himself against calls to resign over charges he flouted COVID restrictions while attending government parties at his residence, 10 Downing Street. One of Johnson's conservative colleagues in Parliament jumped ship today, joined the opposition Labour Party. More from Feature Story News' Benji Heyer in London. British MP Christian Wakeford has defected from the governing Conservatives to the opposition Labour Party. The representative for the constituency of Bury South was elected to the seat in 2019 and is one of possibly dozens of MPs to have written a letter of no confidence in Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Following revelations about parties in Downing Street during the height of coronavirus lockdowns when social gatherings were not permitted. The move increases the pressure on Mr Johnson, who hit back at Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer's demands for him to resign at Parliament's weekly Prime Minister's question. He is wasting this House's time. He's wasting the people's time, Mr Speaker. He continues to be completely irrelevant. From Feature Story News in London, I'm Benji Heyer. California prosecutors have filed two counts of vehicular manslaughter against the driver of a Tesla on autopilot who ran a red light, slammed into another car and killed two people in 2019. The defendant appears to be the first person to be charged with a felony in the United States for a fatal crash involving a motorist who was using a partially automated driving system. Los Angeles County prosecutors filed the charges in October, but they came to light only last week. The misuse of autopilot, which can control steering, speed, and braking, has occurred on numerous occasions and is the subject of investigations by two federal agencies. 
Crews are making railroad track repairs in Los Angeles after a train derailed near the location where thieves have been raiding cargo containers, leaving the tracks littered with empty boxes of packaged goods sent by retailers. It isn't known if Saturday's derailment was caused by the debris left behind by the thieves in the Lincoln Heights area near downtown L.A. Union Pacific says the cause of the derailment is under investigation. The company says 17 train cars came off the tracks. No injuries reported. Cargo containers aboard trains have been targeted by thieves for months. Stolen packages are from retailers, including Amazon, REI, and others. A 22-year Los Angeles Fire Service veteran has been nominated to become the first woman to lead the city's fire department. Deputy Chief Kristen Crowley would become the first female fire chief for the nation's second largest city if the nomination by Mayor Eric Garcetti is confirmed by the city council. Crowley currently holds the jobs of Acting Administrative Operations Chief Deputy and Fire Marshal. She says that keeping the department operationally ready is her top priority. She also says she would focus on firefighter safety, physical health, and overall emotional well-being, as well as diversity, inclusion, and equity. For a second year in a row, the World Economic Forum has canceled its annual meeting in the Alpine resort town of Davos, Switzerland, because of the coronavirus pandemic. For years, the forum has brought together the global elite of billionaires and world leaders, while activists protest outside. Companies make promises to combat climate change, and there's plenty of talk of global inequality. Simon Marks reports. Normally at this time of year, world leaders, captains of industry and finance, representatives of non-governmental organizations and, of course, reporters are clambering through the snows in the Swiss town of Davos for one of the world's most influential annual economic shindigs. But for the second year running, COVID-19 has put paid to all of that. Davos is a ghost town and a limited program of events is taking place only virtually. You know, I think everyone's a little tired of Zoom. I'm not going to lie. We were really looking forward to hosting it in person. Amanda Russo is head of media content for the World Economic Forum. She says there are still valuable conversations taking place this week. Environment makes up a quarter of the program. Coming on from COP26 and all the discussions there, we thought it was really important for leaders to continue these conversations. We highlighted in our global risk report that there's social justice issues around the world. They're growing, they're getting worse due to COVID-19. I think we can all realize that things have gotten a little bit harder for everybody. So we want to talk about how we can get more government support, more support for businesses to look beyond just the bottom line, to actually talk about how can we help the community? How can we help our people more? How can we make work more flexible? On Monday, Chinese President Xi Jinping kicked things off, urging greater global integration in a bid to combat the pandemic as he spoke to the scaled down event. Simon Marks, Washington. California marijuana industry insiders say the practice of working simultaneously in the legal and illicit markets is all too common in the state's struggling pot economy. Legal businesses have long complained that heavy taxes and regulation paired with thriving illegal sales make it impossible for licensed shops to turn a profit. To survive, an increasing number of license holders are secretly operating black market businesses on the side to make ends meet. Leading companies recently warned Governor Gavin Newsom that the legal market could collapse. Newsom says he's open to changes. Partly cloudy skies tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area with highs in the upper 50s around the bay. Sunny with highs in the low 60s further inland tomorrow. Partly cloudy in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow with highs in the low 60s. And sunny skies are predicted for the Los Angeles area with highs in the mid-70s. And that is it for the news tonight. For this Wednesday, January 19th, thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Merkel. Good evening. Tune in Wednesday nights starting at 7 p.m. with Bay Native Circle. 
bringing you today's native issues, people, culture, and events with weekly rotating hosts. Then at 8 p.m., it's Dead to the World with Tim Lynch, featuring the music of the Grateful Dead, the music it's influenced and influenced by, and the night at 10 p.m. with Sing Out, a showcase of the world's ever-changing music realm, hosted by Larry Kelp. That's Wednesday nights on 94.1 KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. Stop, 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 stop. 